Would you welcome to uh, the stage this morning with me, Pastor Kervin Brewington, to share a word this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, sir. How are you guys feeling this morning? If you're excited to be in the house of God, can you just give them a shout of praise right now? Come on. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. And um, I believe God has given me a word for this hour, for this house, for this city. I sat over here or stood over here during worship, and I just felt the Spirit of God just invading my heart. And I believe that there are still yet greater things to be done in this city, in this house, and through this church. And uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. I want to take just a moment to uh, show some honor, some love to your leadership here, to Pastor Weaver. Come on, somebody. To Pastor Jeff. Come on, you guys have some incredible leaders here. It is an honor to be in the house. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I come all the way from Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, quite a ways away. Uh, I am the student and young adult pastor, soon to be a uh, campus pastor at Crossroads Church there. It's an incredible Assemblies of God church. We are so blessed. Uh, we have great leadership there. Jeff Abels is my lead pastor. We've been there about five and a half years. And prior to that, my wife and I traveled for about 12 years full time. I did Christian rap music music and I, I preach I did evangelism and you know my grandma my grandma used to tell me all the time baby I don't like that hippity hoppity mess <laughs> so I don't like that hippity hoppity but after expressing her disdain for my genre and style of, of of music she would always follow it up by saying but baby as long as you're talking about Jesus then it's all right with grandma and through that calling and through the vehicle of that language that this generation embraces we've been able over 12 years to visit nine nations across the world to travel all over the country we've seen thousands of people respond to the gospel why because I believe that God is in the business of reconciling the hearts of people to the Father amen and he's still moving today the way he did in years past and so uh, it's an honor to be here again uh hey can y'all put your hands together for the band this morning they did an incredible job that was so good you guys can go ahead and peace out thank y'all so much and um also i want to take just a minute to introduce my family they're not here in person maybe next time they'll be able to be with me but if you look to the screen this is my lovely family uh my wife that is candace we've known each other since six years old so we go all the way back that's my latin lover and uh beside her and in our laps those are our three mexi melts okay um it's okay you can laugh <laughs> You can laugh. Uh, on the far right is my daughter, Lyric. Uh, she is now 10. This picture is about two years old, but she's 10 years old now. On the far left, that is my middle child, Legend. He's an incredible young man of God. And in the middle, you have Lion. Lion is right now four years old. Lyric and Legend love the Lord with their whole heart. They will pray. They will worship. They will preach to their dolls and set them up. Lion, he don't know Jesus yet. Y'all got to pray for Lion, okay? He's a work in progress, but we're believing uh, for God to encounter that young man. Amen. And so, um, hey, with all that said, let me just say, I am completely uh, ecstatic to be here today. A little bit about myself. You need to understand uh, that I grew up in this small little backwoods church. I attended this backwoods church in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And in that church, the congregation was uh, very multicultural, but it was predominantly black folk and brown folk. But our pastor was this little, he was a 73-year-old little white man about this tall. And his name was Reverend Hubert D. Bays. Now, you know you mean business when your middle name is just an initial, right? And I'm going to tell you right now, Pastor Bays, he could preach the paint off the wall, and he could preach the carpet off the floor. He's what I, he's what I would call a holler back preacher. Now, let me explain what that means. That means that, that when he would preach, he didn't come to preach at you. We would help him preach. And I fall right in the footsteps of my pastor. And so today I want to give you freedom, okay? Somebody say, it's okay. I'm going to give y'all freedom this morning. You can talk back to me. If you feel the Spirit of God speaking and stirring something on the inside, you may want to say hallelujah. Let's practice. All right, come on. Listen, if, you, if, if, you, if something resonates deep on the inside, it is okay to say, preach that. 
All right, here we go. Listen, you may want to do like my grandmama used to do. She didn't say a thing. She would just make the stank face and go, mm. <laughs> It is okay. Listen, we are going to get through this thing, let God speak to our hearts, and we're going to get out of here and beat the Baptist to the buffet. If you're with it, say amen. Come on. Awesome. So, with everything going on with COVID-19 and the quarantine that we've been in and out of and the phases, I would venture to say that there has been, in that moment, in this moment where, where everything's unsure, we can't put dates on the calendar. We have to cancel events and reschedule only to have to cancel them again sometimes. There has been a lack of vision in a lot of folks here in America and in the church. And we know what the Bible says about the scenario where there's a lack of vision, the, the word tells us that where there's a lack of vision, the people perish. I love one translation. It says that where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. And so as I was praying in preparation to be here with my friends this weekend, I felt the Lord speak to my heart that there was a need for someone here to be reminded that there is still destiny in the distance that there is still a great work to be done you see whenever there's no vision we either become reckless or we become passive but I'm here to remind someone in this room this morning that if there was ever a moment in American history at least in my lifetime and I'm sure in some of your lifetimes if there was ever a moment where the world needed an engaged church it is right now if there was ever a time that this world needed a praying church, it is right now. And so today, I want to just jump into this thing by uh, making something known, in case you haven't realized it already. I work with young people <laughs> all the time. They drive me nuts. I have a lot of gray hair in my head because of these teenagers. And so one thing I discovered after traveling on the road for uh, 13 years, when I came off the road and started pastoring young people on a week-to-week -week basis, I quickly discovered that I wasn't near as cool as I thought I was. <laughs> Come on, how many of you guys have teenage children or grandchildren? Listen, they're savages. <laughs> Teenagers are brutal. They're, they're brutal. I remember getting up to preach my first message about five years ago. And I got on stage, and, you know, I'm trying to be hip. I thought I was hip. You know, I'm 35. You know, I think I'm still kind of hip. I get on stage, you know, and I hear the kids say, use this term, let's get crunk, right? So I get on stage and say, hey, guys, let's get crunk. Immediately after the service, they called a press conference. <laughs> they said, Pastor Kervin, listen, um, just so you're aware, we don't get crunk anymore. I was like, well, we don't get crunk. What do we do? They said, we turn up. I said, we turn up? I was like, what is that? Yes, we turn up. That means we get excited. I said, okay, bet. I'm with that. The next week, I get back on stage. I said, all right, guys, let's turn up for Jesus. They said, time out. Pastor, get in the back right now. They said, Pastor, we don't turn up anymore. That's so, ugh, last week. I'm like, last week? They said, yeah, we don't turn up anymore. What do we do now, guys? What do we do? If we don't get crunk, we don't turn up. They said, no, Pastor, we get lit. And I said, lit? What are we lighting up? Is it drugs? <laughs> we don't do that. We don't know. I don't know. But, but what I'm saying is that so quickly in youth culture, uh, these ideas and these, this slang, it changes so quick. I remember a friend of mine two years ago, he called me, and he had um, a job opportunity that, that landed in his lap. He was excited about it. And he used this phrase. He said this. He said, bro, I'm trying to secure the bag. And I'm like, secure the bag. And I went online and Googled it again because I'm, I'm that hip youth pastor. I know all the slang, all the hip slang. And I Googled this phrase, secure the bag. It was made famous by a popular DJ named DJ Khaled. Let me define what this phrase means. Secure the bag is an expression that means to take advantage of an opportunity that is at hand in hopes of obtaining something of great value. Securing the bag is something that although you may feel disconnected from the urban terminology, but the reality is that we have all been in seasons where, we ha where we've had to secure the bag. Let me remind you, maybe years ago, whenever you were applying for that first job, that first job opportunity, whenever you had that interview, what did you do? You put on your shoes, you shined those shoes, you pressed your shirt, you, you combed your hair, you looked in the mirror and you said, 
you are a winner. You got this. You, you, you pumped yourself up. You went into that interview ready to fire off and answer those questions. Why? Because you were going to do whatever it took to secure the bag. I remember, you may remember, a long time ago, maybe if you met your spouse in church. I, I remember, y'all. I, I, I get it. You may have been attending church just by your lonesome, and then you saw that beautiful thing up front worshiping the Lord, and you thought, mm, I choose you. And then, and, then, and then she finally says yes to go out on that date. And you had that first date. What do you do? You buy a new shirt. You brush your teeth. You, 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 you pull out the, the cash out of your uh, account. You're not going and eating hamburgers and cheeseburgers. It's steak and shrimp that night, right? Hello. Why? Because you're going to do whatever it takes to secure the bag. And can I remind you this morning, my brothers and sisters, that I believe every individual in this room has a bag to secure in your future. And that bag is called destiny. And I don't know what you may look in the mirror and think of yourself in this journey of life, in this season and stage of life. You may look in the mirror and feel like, man, well, I've lived my life. I've served God. I've done ministry. I've raised my children. I've released them into the real world. I've done my part. But I've come here all the way from southern Louisiana to remind you that whether you're 16 years old or 73, as long as there is breath in your body, there is still a great work that God wants to do through your life. God is not done with you. We have got to secure the bag. God still wants to use you to make his name famous in the earth. Why? Because divine destiny it is in your DNA. You were crafted flesh and bone around a God dream placed in the earth to proclaim the great exploits of the God that we serve. I believe in this season, the very ones who feel that they've been counted out, God is going to begin calling out. I believe in this next season, God is going to give folks who thought that those fires had, had, had long dissipated, that he's going to begin to rekindle that fire and fan those flames and give you new vision and new dreams to continue doing the work of the Lord and the earth. You know, I, I, I remember as a young man, my mom would always quote this particular passage of scripture over my life. In fact, she would literally read the scripture to me when I was in her womb. It's Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5. I call it my life verse. And the verse goes like this. God prophesies to the prophet Elijah. He speaks to him and he says that I knew you before I formed you in the womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and I appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Now I want you to take notice though of how Jeremiah responds to this word straight from the Lord. Now, mind you, you know, like, could you imagine, like, opening up your email and, all, and you have an email from God? Like, <laughs> that would, like, like, yes, Lord, whatever you say. God speaks directly to the prophet Jeremiah. And what is his response? In verse 6, he says this. He says, oh, sovereign Lord, I cannot speak for you because I am too young. And how often, whenever God calls us to do something great, do we respond just like the prophet Jeremiah? I'm too young, or, or God, I'm, I'm, I'm too old, or God, I'm not talented enough, I'm not equipped enough, I'm unqualified. I hear you talking about this great destiny and calling that you have upon my life, but I just don't see it. Come on, we're just like the men and women of old. Moses, God calls him to redeem his people out of Egyptian captivity, and he tells God, I can't speak well. Just like Gideon, God called to, to, uh, to fight for his people, and his response was, God, I'm too afraid. Just like Peter, after denying Jesus, he says, I'm a failure. And so often what we fail to realize is this. God has no, God could care less about calling the qualified, but rather he qualifies those that he calls. And if he's called you to do great things in the earth, through your family, through your children, through your grandchildren, then guess what? He is going to equip you to carry out that calling. How do I know that? Because we find in a letter to the church in Philippi, Paul tells us in uh, the first chapter, verse 6, he says this. He says, I am certain. Somebody say, I know it. <laughs> he said, I am certain that God who began the good work within you 
will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. You see, just like the prophet Jeremiah, there is still a great work for you to do in this earth. You are a God dream of eternal value and significance wrapped in flesh and blood placed upon the earth to do great things regardless of the season of life you may be in. But watch this. We have got to realize, though, that there are choices and decisions that we have to make right here and right now that will determine whether or not we walk into the fullness of everything God has for us. The choices you make today will determine the future that you and maybe even your children and grand grandchildren will live in tomorrow. So for the next few moments, I want to give you guys and share with you what I like to call the four pillars of purpose. The four pillars of purpose. If you're taking notes, the first one is this. As we seek to discover, God, what is it that you would have me to do in this day, in this hour, in the earth? What is it, God? How, what can I put my hands to to make your name great? The first pillar that we have to address is direction. Direction. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I am navigationally challenged. So I've been like, you know, whenever I'm driving, even in my hometown, I still use my iPhone. I still use my app. Siri, you know, my wife tells me all the time, baby, Siri doesn't know everything. <laughs> I said, when I'm driving on these mean streets, Siri definitely knows everything. You know, and, and I have this pet peeve whenever, you know, you ever ask, ask somebody for directions? Like, hey, how do I get to... Um, to the kangaroo gas station on the you know on this side of town, you you, you know the guy you know the guy that, that says that says well uh, what you want to do is uh exit out of this parking lot turn right right on the on the front lawn then you hit the stop sign turn left go about three throw three and a half miles after you do that me and I see a, a red house with a yellow roof you're gonna turn left right there stop and make sure you wave at Papa Joe and then you're gonna turn another left go down about three miles or so then exit one sixty seven and there it is I'm like bro. I don't need all that. <laughs> Just write it down. Just give me the address. Siri can help me get there. Come on, somebody. Just make it plain. And I believe that we lose sight of that truth that, that God has instructed us in Habakkuk 2.2. 2. The Lord replied to the prophet and he said, write down the revelation. In other words, the dream that God has given you, the thing that you're passionate about, write it down and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may hear it and do what? And run with it. And I believe there are so many Christians we're wandering around aimlessly in life. Like, yes, we, we have our jobs and our careers and we have money in the savings account and our children are, are doing okay and we're just in this routine of just doing life that we lose sight of the fact, man, that there is still great work to be done. And if you want to walk in the purposes of God in this season, you may be sitting here, and I, and I pray that there's someone here that God's stirring in your heart, maybe a newfound passion to maybe serve in the youth department or serve in the children's ministry or serve in one of the other serve team areas that are available. But we have to know at least a general direction of where God is calling us to step into. I remember being a young man in a program called Teen Challenge. Uh, do you guys have Teen Challenge out here? You do? So I'll share a little bit of my story later, but I was a young man in Teen Challenge, and, and I had lived and experienced years of drug addiction and brokenness. I, I was a broken man when I was 17 years old. I was a cocaine addict. I had started smoking crack cocaine. I was an alcoholic. I had been in and out of jail, on and off probation, and I was facing 10 years in prison for an armed robbery. And listen, I don't say any of that to glorify the enemy. I just say all that to remind the enemy that I serve a God who was able to bring beauty out of brokenness. Come on, somebody. And I remember, though, being in Teen Challenge and struggling, asking these questions like, God, what would you have me to do? Like, where do I fit in? What's, what's my calling? And a friend of mine introduced me to this song. And it was a Christian rap song. And it spoke to that very question. And I'm going to share this verse with you guys. Is that all right? I just need about three grandmamas to wave at me and say, it's okay. Come on. We got one, two, three. All right, the rest of y'all got to deal with it, okay? And the verse of the song goes like this, speaking about purpose. It says this. It says, I hear you saying, I know that I got a purpose. I just don't know what it is. Well, let me help you uncover it. 
I tell you what I did. I followed my bents. What do you like to do? Where do you like to go? That should give you a clue. What do you do well? What are some of your strengths? What you like to discuss will probably give you a hint. Tell me what drives you up the wall because your greatest frustration may be the thing you are here to solve. That is, if God gave you the tools to pull it off, and if he has, get up off of your stool and get involved. But don't bury your gift. Don't worry. You're equipped to do what he's called you to do for him. He wants you to take the things you like to do and blend that with the things he told us we must do. So then, if you're spending all your energy and you're fruitful in the ministry, then that's what I call a win-win. And I heard that, and it resonated in my spirit so deeply. And it caused me to look in the mirror and ask those questions. What are some of the things that you enjoy doing? What are some things that you're passionate about? What are the things that drive you crazy? Because could it very well be that the things that drive you the craziest, could it be that God placed you on this earth to be a solution to those issues? To be a solution to those problems? Listen, every good and perfect gift comes from our Father above. But let us not forget that every good and perfect gift that came from him is for us to bring glory and fame to the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Come on, give God a shout of praise even right now. <laughs> Direction. By the way, if you're watching online, I'm so glad you're here. I forgot to say hello at the beginning, but we're glad you're here. Can y'all put your hands together for everyone watching online? <laughs> so glad you're here. Not only do you have to have a sense of direction, but watch me, here we go. We have to understand the importance of connection. And here's where it gets real. You know, there was this man walking down, a farmer walking down the street one day, and he stumbled upon an eagle egg, because that's just randomly what you do when you walk down the street, right? <laughs> he finds this eagle egg, he takes it home, and he puts it in his chicken coop with the rest of his chicken eggs or hen eggs. Time passes by, all the eggs hatch around the same time, and this eagle is being, this eaglet is being raised alongside chicks. So quite naturally, the eaglet does what the chicks do. So the chicks go, the eaglet goes, the chicks peck in the dirt, the eaglet pecks in the dirt. So one day, they're looking into the sky, and the eaglet recognize, he notices this beautiful creature just spanning across the sky with his massive wingspan just soaring in the heavens. And the eaglet says to his brothers and sisters, he says, guys, what is that? And the chicks say, oh, bro, that, that's an eagle. That is the king of the sky. He is the most amazing and most incredible creature with wings. He's beautiful. There's nothing like him. And the eaglet said, wow. He said, hey, guys, do you think that maybe I could do that? And his brothers and sisters laughed. They said, bro, there's no way. That is a creature of the sky. And you and I are simply creatures of the dust. And that poor eaglet lived his life and died thinking that he was nothing more than a chicken because that's who he was connected to. Can I ask you today, who are you connected to? Who are you connected to? Can I tell you, I am a firm believer that the people we are connected to will either propel us into our purpose or they will delay our destiny. They will leave the fruit that God wants to bear forth in your life dangling on rotted tree branches. It is so important that as we look in scripture, we see time and time again that there were tons of relationships where one person's destiny and their God-given assignment was somehow connected and locked into that of another individual. We see it with Moses and Joshua. We see it with Elijah and Elisha. We see it with Paul and Timothy. We see it with Naomi and Ruth and so many others. Can I tell you that who we are connected to is absolutely key if we are going to walk into the fullness of what God has for us. You may have friends that are okay with just sitting back and, and doing nothing with the time that they have on earth, but I'm here to tell you God is awakening the heart of his people to begin crying out to God, to begin interceding, to begin pouring out their heart, to begin pouring out their time and energy because the time is short and there's a world outside of these four beautiful walls that are dying and on their way to a real hell and they need the church to be the church that Jesus Christ died for. 
Listen to me. We have got to be aware of those that we are connected to. And I'm not just talking about friends. I'm talking about sometimes even family members because we all got a few crazies in the bunch. Come on. We got a few crazies in the bunch. And, I, and, and again, we love these individuals and we pray for them. But man, there's some times where we have to draw clear boundaries and say, listen, if you're hindering what God is calling me to, then I'm sorry. I love you. I will pray for you. But there's got to be some boundaries. A few uh, months ago, my wife and I were in our vehicle and we we're about to take off heading to church. And we get in the car. And on the windshield, there is this big old grass. I mean, not even a grass. It's like a locust from like the book of Exodus. I mean, this thing could have been the state bird. It was so huge. And it's on the windshield. And my wife, she hates bugs, so she's freaking out. Get it off! And I'm like, I'm trying. I turn on my windshield wiper. I mean, that thing was like holding on for like dear life. He wasn't going anywhere. And we're driving, and we're coasting about 20 miles an hour, about 30 miles an hour. This thing isn't going anywhere. But it wasn't until I took the exit ramp, and I jumped onto the highway. And as I began pushing the gas down heavier, and we went 40 miles, 50 miles, 60 miles an hour, guess what happened? That grasshopper went flying off the windshield of my vehicle. And I believe that that was a prophetic moment, because I've come, to here, I've come here to tell somebody that there are grasshoppers, spiritual grasshoppers, that we've allowed to sit on the windshield of our lives and I believe that in this hour with all the racial tension in our nation, with all of the hate, with all of the violence I believe that God is about to begin accelerating the purposes of his church and as you begin speeding up there are going to be people in your life that are not going to be able to keep up with the speed at which God is accelerating you into your purpose. And when those grasshoppers, when those dysfunctional, negative, passive-aggressive relationships begin flying off the windshield of your life, don't you you U-turn, don't you hit the brakes. You can pray for them, but you better keep your eyes on the road and your hands at 10 and 2 because there is still great destiny in the distance. There is a broken world that we've been called to reach. There's people that are waiting on us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. There's destiny in the distance. You got to know the importance of direction. You got to understand the importance of connection. But thirdly, we have to also understand the importance of placement. And this is key placement. There's a group of men in 1 Chronicles 12 32 that the Bible mentions them for a specific reason. Here's what the Bible says it says that the sons of Issachar, they were noted as being men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Look at me, my friends. You may have the direction locked in. You may know what it is that you're passionate about, what God is calling you to in the season. You might even be connected to the right people that are helping you to propel into that purpose. But let me ask you this. As you approach that purpose, are you found to be faithful in the current season that God has you in? Are we found to be faithful where God has us right now. Listen to me. In the same way that there's labor pains before a new birth, in the same way that there's a winter season before the new life of spring, the storm before the rainbow, the internship before the job, the, the, the grind before the promotion, there will always be a process before the promise. And sometimes seasons of silence and solitude before we walk into the season of harvest. And although, watch me, although destiny may be in the distance, we can never lose sight of the truth that there will always still be purpose in the present. We can talk about tomorrow all day, but I believe that we serve a God who is a God of this day. He could care less about what you did yesterday. He could care less about what we say we're going to do tomorrow. What God cares about is what we are going to do today. What will we do today? to further the agenda of God's kingdom. Luke 16, 10, Jesus said it best. He said this, he said that whoever can be trusted with very little can be entrusted with very much. And I believe, I don't know about you, but whenever God shines his holy light upon my life, no matter what season I'm in, whether I'm on a mountaintop or in a valley, I want to be found faithful. Come on, church, I said I want to be found faithful. 
I want to be found with my hands to the plow, with my eyes fixed upon God and that that he's called me to do. Because at the end of the day, watch me, if God can trust, if we can trust God in the pit, then God knows he can trust us with the palace. Placement is so key. Here's my fourth and final thought as I close. I was an evangelist for over a decade, so I get two fake closes. <laughs> this is my first fake close, Pastor. <laughs> Here it is. You ready? Timing. And timing is everything. Timing is the glue that holds it all together. You can have a grasp on the direction God's calling you to. You can be connected to the right people. You can even be faithful right where God has you right now, my friend. But if it's not God's timing, then guess what? We're not moving anywhere. We're not taking one step forward. This thought reminds me of this character in the Word of God. You don't really hear much about him. You may not have even ever read about him. His name is David. Anyone heard of King David? <laughs> God calls the prophet Samuel to go to the house of Jesse. He tells Samuel, you go to this house, and one of Jesse's sons is my man. He's going to be the next king of Israel. So Samuel goes to the house of Jesse. He tells him, hey, I need to see all your sons in here. I'm going to anoint one of them. Jesse lines all of his boys up. And, they're just, and I don't know if you read the Bible like I do. I'm kind of ADD. I read the Bible in like vivid HD color. I just imagine all the brothers just, just marching out, just looking like Calvin Klein models, you know, just ugh. And they're lined up shoulder to shoulder. And, and the prophet Samuel goes down the line. No. No. Psych, no. <laughs> no, no, no. He, he, he says, Jesse, are these all your sons? And Jesse responds, oh, well, there is David. Hey, guys, go ahead and bring David in here. I imagine David walking in, fresh from his pasture of sheep. He walks in. The Bible describes him as being a ruddy young man. Many theologians believe, you know, he may have had like red hair, freckles, a little Kool-Aid mustache. You know, I don't know. I imagine him stepping in between his tall brothers, just looking and feeling most unqualified. Like sometimes we feel in a season of life we're in, like we don't have what it takes, like we don't have the energy or the time to do what God's called us to do. I imagine David standing there feeling inadequate. And yet, out of all the strong and mighty brothers, who is the one that God anointed to do his work? It was David. He pours the oil over David's head. David is anointed as the king of Israel. But guess what? He didn't go straight to the throne at that moment. Where did he go? Right back to his field full of sheep. And it was years until he met this tyrant named Goliath. He was in obscurity for years. In all these great psalms that we sing, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. These psalms and these songs that we sing to comfort us in, in hard seasons, do we realize that they weren't written whenever David was on a mountaintop experience or a mountaintop season? These were songs written in the, in the low valley areas, seasons of his life. He kills Goliath. He's victorious. But then Saul goes after his life and he spends years fleeing from cave to cave with 300 criminals and men that were by his side. What am I saying all this to say? I'm, I'm saying all of that to make this point. That before David ever killed a Goliath in public, he had been killing lions and tigers and bears in private. He refused to allow a season of obscurity to rob him from the God-given purpose that he had placed upon his life. He refused to sit back and wait till he was on a throne to lead. No, before he led a nation, he led a group of 300 ragtag men in a season of darkness and obscurity. And can I tell you today, my friend, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 and 11, it says that everything that happens in life there's a season. There's a right time for everything under heaven. And I know that God has made everything beautiful in his timing. 
And I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you think of your life, if you feel like your life is spent. But I've come to remind someone here that God is not done with you. That there is a need that only you can meet in this nation, in your family, in your friend group, in your workplace, in this community. Is there anyone that would just say yes? God, I'm available. Use me, God. Anoint me. I believe that you can empower and equip me to do what you've called me to do. Amen? Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today, you will never know the fullness of what God has for you in terms of vision and destiny if you have not surrendered to his lordship. You may be here today and maybe you say, hey, I've never given my life to the Lord. He's not king of my life. He doesn't call the shots in my life. I do. If that's you, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the gospel. I'm going to count to three, and when I do, I want you just to lift your hand if that's you. And if you would say yes to Jesus, yes to his salvation, yes to his grace. He loves you. He died for you, gave his life for you, and he has a plan for your life. One, two, there may not be none, but there might be one. One, two, three. If that's you, just lift your hand right where you're at. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. I saw that hand. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. I see that hand. God bless you. I want to lead you in a prayer. And every Christ follower in this room, we're going to pray this prayer with you. Come on, church. Let's pray. Say, Jesus, it's me. You know who I am. I've made mistakes. I'm not perfect. And I've broken your heart. But today, I choose you. I believe you're the son of God. You died for my sin, rose from the dead. And one day, you'll bring me home. But right now, I need you. Forgive my sin, heal my heart, and change my mind. I don't want to stay the same. I want to live for you. So Holy Spirit, help me to do that. And I thank you that today I am saved. Amen and amen. And Lord, I thank you for your people today, and I pray that we would leave this room Lord, with a new fresh fire in our hearts to be used by you, to be clay in the hand of the potter. Lord, we love you and we thank you for what you have yet to do in this city, through this house, and in our hearts. In the mighty, matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God a shout of praise if you would right now. Thank you.